I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Anastasia Egorova, the founder and CEO of Open Longevity and vice president at the Science for Life Extension Foundation. Anastasia has a background in business, creative design, and has studied molecular biology and physics at Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology and clinical monitoring at MGMSU. She joins us today to continue discussing the goals, research, and progress happening in longevity and life extension, and to describe how community activism and open organizations are helping to improve anti-aging medicine. So Anastasia, welcome back. I appreciate you joining me once again. Um, so you know, we started out last time with kind of an overview of the projects, and we got into the Open Longevity Project a bit. So this time, I wanted to explore with you, what is it about the open nature of this project that makes it so important? Uh, yes, thank you for having me once again. It's a pleasure. Uh, yeah, openness. Uh, it's in the name of our organization, of our nonprofit. Uh, we emphasize it a lot. We think uh, that this is like the major key, probably the solution of how to expand the field, uh, the longevity field and radical life extension field. Uh, why do we, why do we think that openness might work? Why openness uh, in general? Well, what are the alternatives there, right? Uh, it's either traditional academic uh, research, which is sort of open to because they are, most of the time is obliged to publish the results afterwards. Uh, and most of the time it's being done on a non-profit basis as well. But is it that open? Uh, we're not, uh, we're going to see the result in, pro in the process. If uh, the outcome won't be as good, it probably won't be published at all. Uh, and also, well, you know, who stops uh, all of these academic researchers to then spin off with their with a startup, with a commercial um, initiative there. Yeah. So if if I could if I could interject for a moment in terms of academic research, you described this a moment ago. I I believe I've seen a few examples of this in the past, where a researcher will achieve a breakthrough, and and of course their initial breakthrough, right? They publish as much as they can about that. Usually small studies with lab animals, something along those lines, and at that point oftentimes they get picked up by a startup or a drug company or something like that. And what they've done becomes closed and it disappears, right? And I think that was what you were describing as, as kind of the enemy of this open collaborative sharing that moves everything forward. Yes, exactly. Of course, sometimes it works. And uh, this is the known path of how uh, any drug is being developed right now. First started up as academia, most of the times, and then it grows. Uh, so a bigger company will swallow this result and then even bigger one will swallow this result on the next stage because every next step uh, is more pricey. And in the end, only a huge foreign company will be able to run actual clinical research and bring it into market. That's how it's being done right now. Um, and it's like sort of okay, it works. Uh, we see professionals uh, on all of these stages. But, you know, we actually had another example. We had COVID. We had COVID and during those, those two years, we, like we watched scientists uh, been working on it, not even two years. Some achieved uh, some results within half a year and uh, a year even. And here, here it is, uh, here they are, uh, vaccines. Uh, and it was completely open. It was radically open because everybody, and, and it was done without any questions, you know? Well, it was it can, quite obvious yeah. that it has to be done completely open, as open as possible. So the the the, the radical nature of the openness surrounding COVID, right? Did, are, were there pros and cons associated with that? Were there, were there good and, and bad aspects to it? Or would you say it was really all good, I guess? Oh, uh, well, we had the result. So with COVID, uh, it turned out great, really. It's a great example. Uh, were there cons? Well, we're trying to be as open as possible, like we as an organization, and I can see several problems there. Uh, of course, you're getting critique uh, from the very start. Uh, and it's just something you have to deal with constantly. Uh, if you're being honest to yourself, with your, to your audience, to 
to the community, to the field. If you're stating that you're open, you are being open, then yeah, they will see the fails and everything. Uh, so yeah, that might spoil uh, the whole process, of course. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it is, it's very easy to you know invite talented people uh, into research, uh, into the movement, uh, when you are completely open. Uh, this non-commercial approach, like non-traditional approach to biochemistry research, um, doesn't really seem so weird uh, for the volunteers and especially for the IT people who are more used to these kind of things. You know, open an eye and open. Uh, there, are, there were a lot of open initiatives to, in IT world, uh, which brought brought the field further. Uh, so these are good examples as well. Uh, so these are uh, good things about it. Uh, what is the main? What's the main good thing about an open approach is that you're you get um, very valuable feedback from specialists from the very beginning. You don't really waste your time on uh, meaningless uh, design, not perfect designs of experiments. So yeah, that's uh, that's great. Um, by the way, I haven't, I don't really remember uh, researching COVID getting too much of, you know, uh, bad feedback from the community because everybody, you know, understood uh, that this is an urgent matter that everybody are working on their like high pressure there. Uh, of course, there were like different uh, different comments uh, during the whole process, but in the end, it turned out great. Yeah, well, and you know, longevity in in a strange sort of way is so much more important than COVID. I mean, as they say, life has a hundred percent fatality rate, right? With COVID, it was three to five percent. Just age in general is a hundred percent. So it's something, you know, I, there's not necessarily the time pressure that there was for COVID trying to stop the spread of it, but at the same time, it's incredibly important. It, you know, and one of the things that I've been reading about lately is kind of a change in terminology that I like from lifespan to health span. And I'm sure you've probably read about that too, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Frankly, there is there are like two camps in the field, uh, and one of the camp is very much against uh, this health span approach, uh, and I can understand their logic. Uh, of course, when I when it's like being brought up first in the conversation to a new person, like what do you do? I do longevity research, and they're like, hmm, is it like I don't want to live for 150 years being old, uh, and I like. Why, how do you even come to this conclusion from a word of longevity? So from that perspective, yeah, health span is a very good you know, way to, to present the idea uh, during the first conversation, probably. Uh, but there is a, a thing there. I think that longevity, longevity, uh, sorry. Uh, when we are being focused on health span and we present it as our goal, we forget about radical life extension. Because uh, this, like somehow, these are two different approaches. Of course, they can be combined in one. And frankly, you cannot achieve radical life extension without extending the health span as well. Well, but when we so so let me let me stop you because you've mentioned radical mm -hmm. life extension several times. Can you describe? Yeah what that is and what it means because this is the core I this is the core of your passion for this and so that's that's yeah, why I would love sure. to learn more of course uh, um of course we can you know come up with different um uh words that oh sorry you'll have to edit me here <laughs> oh no that's okay yeah take your time uh, I can I can do lots of editing uh okay so radical life extension is basically when you cross the threshold of a natural lifespan. So for a human being, it's 120 years, probably. We know just several of those uh, examples. Uh, we, don't, we don't really know a lot of people living that far in the future. So like 100, 120 years, probably. And if we are able to live to 150 and then even more, this means we achieve radical life extension technologies. 
whilst uh, longevity is just, you know, uh, raising the, the possibility of you and me to live up to 100 years, which is um, for me, of course, this is, the, uh, this is a good goal, but if you state it as a goal, just longevity, just this longevity, just healthy lifespan until uh, like 100, 110, I don't know, like, okay. or, or 90 even years. So, so the, the health span... Goal, you, won't go, you won't come to the radical life extension goal. This is, these are different approaches there, completely different approaches. Yeah, the, the health span why. approach would be about keeping people in peak condition for their natural lifespan as, as long as possible, maybe about a hundred years. The radical life extension is now I've read that the maximum age is probably 120 to 150. Do you think that that age will continue to increase? Do you think we'll be able to push that back further and further? I think it, well, uh, if we don't really apply any genetic therapies, uh, any radical therapies, frankly, uh, we won't be able to do, to cross this threshold. So, it, it, this is our natural lifespan. But uh, coming, coming back to health span and lifespan and radical life extension, what's the difference there? Basically, these are all the same things. You can achieve longevity without uh, expanding the health span. You can achieve radical life extension without uh, prolongating the healthy period of your time. This is all that comes together. It's just how you state your goals. Yeah. If you state your goal is a healthy lifestyle and health span uh, extension, good diet probably will be enough. You know, just healthy lifestyle, moderate uh, workouts, healthy li uh, healthy diet, uh, stress less, sleep more. It works. Uh, most of the times, it will be enough. So for me, longevity uh, as a task is not really a scientific, a scientific question, but more of an organizational question. How do we make, um, how do we make a healthy um, medical services more affordable to the people, especially in the United States? Uh, how do we inspire people to stick uh, to the healthy lifestyle? And these are not you know, scientific tasks. You know, these are very important and complicated tasks, of course. Uh, but we really know, we really know how to, how to extend the median lifespan of society in general. So longevity tasks are not mostly the scientific tasks. And if we're stating the goal as radical life extension, crossing the threshold, not being afraid to state it as a goal, to say out loud that yes, I'm into you know extending my lifespan, nothing but bad about it. Uh, then a completely different research will be done. Completely different research will be able to uh, fundraise for it. Okay. Like, uh, yeah, please. <laughs> Well, you know, change is one of those things that's it, it, the psychological aspects of this intrigue me. Um, change is one of those things that's a normal part of the human experience. You know, for instance, I noticed that you're wearing glasses, right, to correct your vision. Yes. You have pierced ears. Uh, you know, when I was a child, I had braces. Um, you know, so we we modify our bodies all the time to suit our needs and to suit our social conditions. We don't think twice about it. But when it comes to aging, there there does seem to be this feeling from some people that we're disrupting the natural order, I guess. And, you know, but I, I can't help but wonder if that, in some ways, it almost reminds me of electric vehicles, where people say, well, this will never happen. This could never happen, you know, and then and then it did happen. And it really wasn't all of the, the panic that people thought it would be, I guess. Oh, I'm sure that as soon as uh, technologies will be on the market, uh, people will just try them out and they will be, you know, natural. Uh, it's just, you take it and it works, it's safe. Why not use it? Why not take it? Well, and as, especially when it comes to longevity, I yeah. noticed this taking supplements through the Longevity Forum, right? I would go into Longevity. I noticed lots of people taking supplements and describing them and, 
I take the supplement and I would think, how do I know if this works? You'd have to take it for a hundred years to tell if it's doing anything. So th- I think that's one of the, the challenges, you know. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah diagnostics diagnostics is, a, is a huge challenge in longevity field. Uh, sooner or later, we will have to run clinical trials, you know, research on people. And diagnostics uh, is a must to run the research there. And it hasn't been solved yet. So yeah, yeah, that's very that's a very important topic to, to tackle there. The the and anecdotal we- stories are, and some of them are downright humorous, but a, a few of them were, you know, I would read posts by people saying, "Well, I swear by this. I've been taking this for five years, and I haven't aged a day." And I'm like, "Well, it's only five years. How would you know?" You know, but mm-hmm. so so yeah. it's but but I think that outlines a challenge. Now maybe the open nature of this also, I'm sure that that helps you corroborate and collaborate more effectively, right? So you're able to take test results from rats and mice and small animals and share those results. And I've already seen some of that online um, where people would share results. They say, look, here was a study done over here. Here was another study done over there. And, you know, the the control animals seem to be the same. And, you know, this, this life extension seemed to have this effect. So, so by coordinating that, it seems like your project may be able to help make a giant difference. It is a very, uh, it's, it's not that easy actually to organize an open project. Uh, and it's not that um, cheap to make it uh, an open project as well, because you will have to create the platform to share the data, to share the road data, uh, not, al- not only the outcomes. Uh, and also, if you're making an open, it doesn't really, it doesn't mean that you only, you know, share the results. Uh, you will have to make the whole process very approachable. So a person will be able to read about it, to understand it. So the information has to be presented mm-hmm. on different levels of complexity. Uh, it has to be uh, very interesting and engaging for people without scientific background. And these... Uh, our potential sponsors are most most of the time are these people without strong scientific background, which is okay, but still we need to learn how to communicate with them. And volunteers, not always are scientists per se, but they can spread the word and they can first learn what word to spread, right? Uh, and also we have to present it on a very complicated professional level for the professionals uh, to, to, to look presentable to the professionals. And all of these presentations uh, takes a lot of effort and resources too. And also, preferably, you will have to make reports, uh, I don't know, monthly or quarterly. Uh, Again, this is a lot of uh, work there. So this completely new approach, like 100% open approach, is different. We think it's better, but it's not necessarily like much cheaper. That, That I can say for sure, especially when you're just starting. Uh, we have to maybe run first few experiments this way uh, to establish the platform to then scale it. But on the on the first steps uh, during the fir- first experiments of yours, it's it's, uh, it's quite pr- pricey <laughs> to organize well, it. Now, if it's okay to change the topic a little bit, sure. one of the things I wanted to ask, because again, you you have a long term interest in this, you have a medical background, you have a lot of knowledge in this area. I, I was hoping to ask what what are what are your I, I think everyone has their avenues where they they say I'm you know I'm really excited about this technology or this type of research. Do you have anything like that? Do you have particular approaches that you're really excited about compared to everything that's being done? Oh, uh, you know I mentioned it in our last interview and it's extracellular metrics. I, I really like this topic. Uh, I don't know if I should go there like again because we talked about it before. Yeah, um, and you you yeah. mentioned collagen. I think the breakdown in collagen, which is interesting. I've been reading more about that lately. Um, and yeah, so that's that's yours, uh, the extracellular matrix. Yeah, and- I like uh, I like it because you know it's a stochastic process in our body. The degradation of the extracellular matrix is just something that's happening to your body to you without your control, it, it doesn't matter what, what your 
lifestyle is, it will happen, uh, which is a sad and scary thing, of course, but it is, uh, the nature of it looks like a nature of aging. Whatever you do to your body, how, like, it doesn't matter how healthy your lifestyle is, you will age in the end. So any process that looks this way looks like a potential, you know, basis for aging, and we need to look into that. So it, it looks very much promising and interesting in terms of understand, understanding the nature of aging. I'm, I'm not saying that the aging of extra cell metrics will be the only or maybe the most important um, part of aging there or mechanisms of aging, but it is uh, one of the uh, very important ones for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I know David Sinclair, again, has been experimenting with, uh, he, he actually, he has several different experiments. He just recently published on using three of the four Yamanaka factors to, to partially regress cells. And, and so that's something that I've been excited about. Um, Dr. Or, or, I'm sorry, Elizabeth Parrish, um, she did a gene therapy for yeah. And it, it was she, it was for telomerase, but she also did one for a muscle growth factor, and and she indicated she's getting results from both. And so I, I think you're right, though. I think that it is. You mentioned this in your notes: a combinatorial approach. It's not probably one magic bullet. It's a, a number of different solutions that work together, right? Uh, I like combinatorial approach. Uh, we're sticking to that as a, an organization. Um, I'm not sure we can refer to Liz's example here. Uh, first of all, I like her boldness and the fact that she's advocating for the longevity ideas and the like, and, and you know the idea of experimenting on yourself. You, uh, you, you need a you know, uh, you have the the right to do whatever you want to your body. Of course, it, it's great that she did that and she did that publicly uh, only it's just one experiment there uh, we don't really uh, yeah we can't really work with that data uh, and we can't really like check uh, it wasn't registered properly so yeah but I, with all my know, I, this uh, too Liz in in Liz's case uh, you know and I guess there are different ways to describe it it reminds me of the the person who cured if I remember right they cured uh it causes not heartburn, but um, it, there was a doctor who actually, he, he claimed that it was bacterial in nature when the stomach lining breaks down. And he actually gave himself the illness and, and then used antibiotics to cure it. And, and so he self guinea pigged, you know, and I, I guess different people might regard that in different ways. Certainly the medical establishment is not in favor of things like that, but um you know what? I actually discussed uh, this thing with other specialists who run clinical trials, uh, also in our, in other in our field, uh, and their proposition, which I uh, which I agree with, to present a phase zero to clinical trials at, uh, in general to register it as an official phase, and this phase zero will be self-experimenting. Most of the researchers do mm. something to them. It, if you don't do that, well, it's either you don't really need the, the drug. Um, it's quite often the case if you're healthy. But still, uh, if you do something to yourself, it means you, that you trust your guts, trust your idea uh, well enough, and you can register these uh, analytical uh, you know, experiments, maybe several of those like pre-phase and make it official. Uh, that could probably help longevity uh, clinical trials research. Another idea might be because clinical trials in the longevity field are very complicating. They're potentially they are facing obstacles of uh, you know we are we live quite long. Uh, we have no diagnostics. Uh, we know that we don't really have biomarkers to measure whether the therapy worked or not, and we cannot wait for the people uh, to die of old age. Um, during the the, the, the the trials, right? So another another thing there, another solution for longevity field will be to merge phase three and phase four. Uh, as soon as you proved that the therapy is safe, as soon as you proved that it works uh, on some people, 
sort of like works, like it's not harmful. Uh, you can then go and give the people the ability to experiment on themselves, but do it officially. For, for us, for the authority, not to question the results as they are doing it with police right now. Give uh, people a chance to take the drugs if they are safe. Uh, give them the design, the, the good quality protocol, and give them some IT tool to then uh, download, uh, upload the data. Um, so help them, you know, in organizational way, and also make it official. That might help. That might help uh, clinical I research. See. And and then and then to bring this full circle, your mm -hmm. project could help manage all of this data. And, and help manage the collaboration? Oh, uh, I certainly hope so. Uh, I, I hope uh, that we will be able as soon as the data will be there. That's oh, for sure. Wonderful. Well, Anastasia, we're almost out of time for this evening. Thank oh. you so much for joining me. I, I can't thank you enough. It And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you.